Well, hello and welcome to Inside Geneva here from Geneva's Graduate Institute. In these strange times, we've got a fairly empty auditorium, but a full virtual auditorium. And to those watching and listening right now, a reminder that Inside Geneva comes out every two weeks and you can subscribe to us or listen to us via the Swiss Info website. Today, we've got a really, really interesting and topical discussion. You can see behind me, it's the UN at 75. We're going to make the effort, though, because there's been a lot said about the past, we're going to make an effort to look forward from our present slightly awkward situation and see how the UN can help us. And is it fit for purpose for the next 75 years, or is it going to wither away and disappear? maybe in five. I've got a great panel uh, spanning expertise and generations here to talk about that. First, uh, Professor Mahmoud Mohamedou, Professor of International Relations, International History, I'm sorry, here at the Graduate Institute. Uh, Malika Girl, master's student specializing in global security here at the Graduate Institute. And our resident analyst, Daniel Warner. Later in the program, we will also be taking your questions. You can submit them online, so get to it if, uh, if you have a burning issue you'd like us to discuss. But to begin, let's start right up to date. The United Nations, way back, a little bit of history first, in fact, way back in 1945, huge aspirations, huge hopes, President Harry Truman said it was the body that could be a victory over war itself, designed to deal with all of the big challenges that the world faces and to try and join forces to cope with them together in a peaceful way. Mahmoud, we've got right now the global challenge. You couldn't design one that might be more suited for, for the United Nations to deal with. It is a pandemic. We are all having our lives disrupted in the face of it. Um, how do you think the United Nations and its health body, the WHO, is coping? Well, you're absolutely right. In terms of perfect storm in a negative sense, in a clinical sense, shall we say, it is an opportunity for an organization that has been historically designed to address the world's problem uh, in their fullness, to sort of step up and find ways to, to handle this. Um, I think there is clearly there, to begin with, a challenge of novelty. I think the United Nations is, is not necessarily a place where innovation has historically been a place of investment. There's a lot of discussions and debate about that. So to have an expectation that it would have sort of foreseen such development um, is not necessarily going to be immediately kind of a, a starting point. But by virtue of its mission, by virtue of the resources, by virtue of the in involvement of essentially the world in this, certainly it lands it at the feet of the organization. Now, I think what we've seen so far is not necessarily a stellar uh, performance, possibly quite the opposite in some sectors. I think the usual problems with the United Nations have manifested themselves. The politicization of many of these issues, sort of the division geographically, the question of having the resources not necessarily aligned. And I think this is something that this time around must not stand in the way. This is some, a, a, one of those challenges where we certainly need to transcend and move beyond. And I would not necessarily think that a specialized agency, WHO in this case, is going to be necessarily the only place for that. By mission, by mandate, it is the logical starting point. But I think given precisely what you were saying, the sort of the fullness of the problem, it brings a much more comprehensive sort of set of uh, dimensions, um, obviously the health aspect, but very rapidly we've seen matters of social development, matters of uh, population, matters of security, uh, matters of democracy raised within this, the whole questions of secrecy, surveillance, mm -hmm. rights, all of this. It's really something that needs to be tackled, I think, with far more sort of vision than what we've seen so far. Malika, let's ask you, because like all of us, in fact, you are personally affected by this pandemic. You've arrived from Delhi. You've had to quarantine in Geneva for two weeks. The classes that you've enrolled for are now going online. 
do you see the United Nations as the, the body that can put this, this, this chaos right? I think it's the best hope we have. I mean, it's definitely not... Um, I mean, the COVID situation has really revealed the shortcomings in its um, process and in its structure as a whole. But as of now, I really do think it's the best hope we have. The best hope we have, the only hope we have, possibly. Uh, Danny, what about you? I mean, the WHO has had a uh, Department of Pandemic Preparedness for at least 10 years. Was it prepared? Is it doing its job? Well, I mean, I have a certain sympathy for organizations that are 75 years old uh, for personal <laughs> reasons. Uh, but uh, Mahmoud made an interesting point. He mentioned the specificity of the WHO, a specific agency. The organization was created really in the interest of peace and security. That was the fundamental cause in 1945. Now, after that, have developed these specialized agencies, but no agency really can deal with all the problems that Mahmoud mentioned, social development, democracy, and equality. And the question is, at this particular moment in history, we see that most countries are turning inward because of various difficulties, technology, etc. So the political will, in the terms of the political scientists, is really not there for cooperation. And the second point is that traditionally, going back to 1945, it was the United States that was the leader in the multilateral system. And we now see with the current president in the United States withdrawing from that. And the fact that during this pandemic, when funds would be absolutely necessary, it's the United States that says it's withdrawing its funds and suspending that from the organization. So it's the bad moment for the pandemic to come with the Trump administration. Uh, whether that will change after November 3rd, we'll have to see. I wanted to ask you that, Mahmoud, as well, because you know the, th this pandemic has, in a way, exposed some of the stresses on multilateralism. I mean, health is one of the key, like, hot button issues. People are, countries, governments are going to put their own people first. Yeah. And we have seen, with the United States, this, uh, unwillingness to support the WHO in a multilateral approach, but not just with the WHO. We've had the withdrawal from the climate change. I mean, do you see this stress as something that could really damage the UN, you know, for the future? Well, undermine well of it? course, and not only those cases you mentioned, but uh, there's a certain tradition of American exceptionalism vis-a-vis -vis this organization. We've seen it in the case of the Human Rights Council, we've seen it in the case of UNESCO, in and out, uh, as it were. Um, to some extent, that's the prerogative of the United States. This is a policy matter, and that's what it is. The difficulty is, is what Daniel mentioned, which is the timing and the implications. If you happen to be sort of the, w the global power, as it were, and if you're doing this in the midst of an unprecedented pandemic to do this, Obviously, in the case of Mr. Trump, for political reasons uh, and a dismissal of science, as we have come to know from him, there's, there's a problematic set of consequences. It sends the wrong message at the wrong time. It weakens an institution. I think WHO has not necessarily done a good job and is itself guilty of some politicization of the problem early on, as we've seen of the manner in which it handled China and the relationship with that. But that's part of the process of dealing with it. Uh, multilateralism is what you make of it. If you're going to step out and es essentially not engage with sort of the, the, um, the functioning of it, right, you're essentially sort of not helping the system, which remains our only hope, uh, as she pointed out. I think it is fundamentally a sense of uh, political uh, will to engage and do the things that need to be done. And we should also point out to the urgency of this. I mean, mm -hmm. look at the numbers around us. The, the, we're in the millions of people uh, affected, uh, killed. Uh, this is really something that is going to go far beyond the policies of one administration uh, and its choice not to engage uh, for, as I said, its prerogative. Certainly, we can respect that. Um, but it's not so easily done today in the context of multilateralism, as it were. Malika, I'm really interested in getting your views on this. You're the younger generation. You're from India, a huge democracy which has never had the, the weight that the United States has in the United Nations. How is, how is the US position viewed from, uh, among your generation right now, particularly in relation to this withdrawing from 
some areas. Well, I think I would just like to add to this that regimes may come and go, but the need for international cooperation remains constant. So um, even though, I mean, I don't think we can completely blame COVID for this whole um, retraction from multilateralism. As you said, the Paris Agreement, um, US withdrew from it way back in 2017 as well. So I think what really, um, what we need to see is that multilateralism needs to sort of exponentially increase with time passing because more and more we are facing problems that can't be solved unilaterally, even though we would like them to be. So overall, I really think that um, we need to um, focus more on multilateralism as opposed to retracting from it. So you would view the, the US position with a certain amount of concern, I guess. Definitely. Okay. Danny, Malika said that multilateralism has to be kind of increased exponentially. I mean, rather similar to the, to the COVID-19 infection rate, perhaps. But I mean, how are we going to achieve that when you have big powers or significant emerging powers, it's not just the United States, we have, for example, Brazil, not entirely willing to, to play ball in the multilateral field. How are we going to, to, to bring things back to that vision of 1945? Well, I mean, I don't think we can. I mean, I can't go back to where I was in 1945, actually 1946 when I was born. All right, let's just get uh, that straight. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, I, th I think the question Imogen raises the issue of the state system. In 1945, it was a group of states basically sitting down, and the preamble to the charter says, we the peoples. And I think one of the problems for Malika and her generation is that they don't see the individual input, they see mostly states. And here in Geneva, there's only one organization in Geneva, UN organization, that has in its charter civil society, and that's the International Labor Organization, has unions. Other than that, it's all state-centric. And the problem is for the young generation, for people who follow climate change, Greta, et cetera, how does they get into the system? And we know even the Human Rights Council has terrible problems. Who are they going to accredit? Because there are all these NGOs coming in. WTO, World Trade Organization, has the same problem. So while the system remains state-centric, and we can argue about membership in the Security Council, the question is the new generation, the younger people, they want to be involved in these issues, and they don't have the legitimacy or the authority in the UN system. Well, the UN carried out this survey this year, The Future We Want, um, and particularly wanted to get young people on board. What do people want from the UN? of the future. I mean, it did emerge, I think, that 87% of people, I mean, the UN got the result it wanted, basically 87% uh, said they wanted to stick with multilateralism and that there were issues that uh, the world needed to cope with together. Malika, you looked at that survey yourself. Um, did you feel included the way Danny has, 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 has described there? Did you feel that this is now a body that where you can have a say? I feel that um, there is scope for people to be included now, but it's not at the level that it should be just yet. For example, I mean, if you, if you were to ask me what I really want from the UN, I would say that I just, at a, at a, at a very minimum level, I just wanted to fulfill on the purpose that it was created for. For example, I mean, um, so there is, um, we need greater inclusivity of less represented sections, particularly the youth in decision making, because right now, if you look at the statistics, the average age of an MP is 53, but half the population is under 30 years old. So I really think that the UN needs to strive to bridge that gap. It needs to move beyond high-minded rhetoric and it, and it needs to produce results which should come up through a bottom-up approach that really take into account the voices of the people whose lives its decisions will ultimately be affecting. I think that's basically what we want. But Mahmoud, the UN is a long way from that vision, isn't it? I mean, when we, we talk about including 
people of Malika's generation or this, this incredible movement around climate change, yes. young people all over the world. We go back to the UN and we see Security Council, the same five countries which were the victors in the Second World War and whatever successive Secretary Generals have tried to do, there seems no way of changing that. No. Um and, and, and the, the points both Malika and, and Danny just raised are very important. Y you want to be fair to the UN, right? It, it's, there's so much hope for it, and there's a certain inevitability of the United Nations, given the way the world functions today. But at the same time, one of the criticisms that we hear a lot, um, and it's actually a very valid uh, criticism, is that it speaks the right sort of things and the right language, and including the youth or issues about racism and diversity. But when you look at the facts, it's not necessarily there. There's a big gap between sort of a, something that is declamatory and something that is performative in this case. The uh, question of diversity, which was raised in an April 2019 uh, survey by the UN, to their credit, but revealed a huge gap in terms of representation, an over-representation of about five or six countries, the US, the UK, France, Italy, Spain, and surprisingly, in the jobs in the UN, as opposed to the rest of the 193 countries, as it were. Uh, as an example, but I think this also speaking to the nature of how this was built, the sort of the the centrality of the state, and, 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 and Daniel is right, this is not necessarily in sync with how the world is functioning today. You spoke about civil society, we can think about the place of the corporate world, we can think about many other such actors, the very notion of non-state actors, mm -hmm. including citizens and investigative sort of citizens producing change, are not necessarily somehow built into that system. Of course, the sovereignty issue remains what it is, right? But there is a, a lot of place for that. Now, the second big question that comes perennially, and you're absolutely right, is the so-called reform of the Security Council. Now, let's just essentially call it as, as it is. The structure of the Security Council does not make sense today in 2020. It's a snapshot of the power relations of 1945. That's what it is. So you have, you mentioned India, which should be on the Security Council, or Indonesia, or uh, Egypt, or South Africa, or Brazil, sort of the large actors of today's politics, global politics, are not there. When you have France, and actually why France and not Germany, if you're looking at the, the, the weight of, of European powers, for instance. So you have something that, that is regularly discussed in a very bureaucratic manner, in a very political manner, and it remains a problem of representativity of the world and to be in sync with how to work with the world and how to have consequences. You're not gonna have much multilateralism if the actors are not, don't, do not have a, a say at this sort of proverbial table. Well, let's try some blue sky thinking. I'll start with you, Danny, we'll land this on you. Um, how do, we, how do we reform it? Two well, key things. Well, I don't think changing the Security Council uh, will ever happen. It's like changing deck chairs on the Titanic or the Electoral College in the United States. I think the UN should focus on what it has as a comparative advantage. When the charter was done in 45, it was supposed to have a force, an armed force, only for the UN. And I think in peace and security, there it can have some kind of impact, but it has not been successful. I can mention a series of what we call frozen conflicts, Transnistria, Georgia, Yemen, we can go on. And there they have to get armies from outside. In the Congo they have, what, 15,000 troops at a billion dollars a year from different countries. And I don't think it's been successful on peace stabilization. Uh, and I think that's really a comparative advantage. On the other hand, we have certain specialized agencies such as the World Intellectual Property Organization, High Commissioner for Refugees, there we can see a certain impact. But as long as it deals with everything at the same time, I don't think it's going to be very successful. And I think it has to really make certain kind of priorities if it's going to be representative of the global picture. Lots of countries are finding what we call workarounds. There are other places to go, the G7, G20, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and I think there we're gonna see people saying, well, if the UN can't do it, we'll go to other places that are more specific and have an advantage. Malika, you said 
you would wanted the UN to fulfill what it said it was going to do in 1945. Um, however, the UN now is much bigger and is involved in all sorts of things that, that nobody in 1945, who were the vast majority, if not all, men, um, are, were involved in. Gender equality, education for girls, all, of the, all sorts of things, uh, racial equality. Um, do you think those things are too much for the UN? Or are they, for you, as the younger generation, core elements that need to be kept? I think they are core elements that need to be kept. I mean, um, you're right that the UN has expanded in terms of its scope and its focus, but it, even in 1945, there was still there was still focus on human rights and gender rights are human rights as well. So you can't just narrow down the scope of the UN depending on what's convenient for you. You have to evolve with the times. But Mahmoud, then we come back to the age-old discussion, don't we, that it's only as strong as its member states yes. and the different stakeholders, different countries, different cultural backgrounds, different generations have different, very different views about that, what the UN should actually be doing. But there's room for, um, f for progress, I would say. If, if we look at everything we've seen in terms of the history, in terms of the initial focus on peace and security, correct, you see nonetheless that there's there's a time, for instance, which is a bit forgotten in the 90s, where the UN was able to expand its purview following the Cold War. What was interesting then, you had a series of a 10 years, a series of conferences which brought new themes that had been dealt with peripherally. Uh, if you recall the, consequence, uh, the conferences on social development, on women, on the po population, on racism, on universal jurisdiction. Uh, there's about six or seven on human rights in Vienna in 93. Oh, these themes had been frozen, indeed, during the Cold War, and the 90s allowed for an expansion. That. Not that this was much progress in terms of success stories. They're very hard to find, and the politics of it remained, and even these issues were politicized. But what I'm pointing out to is the possibility of moments in which you can expand the purview by sort of going into that which needs to be done. And the point, as we started, is that today is not only is this needed, but this is urgently needed. I think for me the main thing that has been lacking in recent years for the UN is strong leadership. Uh, all of these things that we have mentioned can remain very uh, conceptual or even bureaucratic, right? But if you have the proper leadership that is going to put the political will, the regular pushback against the states that will very logically, I would feel like saying, or naturally come back to a very conservative mode of, of sort of doing things that can be done or that they would like to do. You need strong leadership. In the early 60s, the UN was driven by such leadership. Uh, and we have seen time and again the possibility of that. But in recent years, I think we have had a much more kind of uh, subdued leadership. You know, again, speaking the right things, but pushing back against states calls for a lot of stamina. And, and, and this is something that we need today, I think, fundamentally, to establish those new visions. So it's interesting you say that because I interviewed the former UN Human Rights Commissioner, Zaydrad Al Hussein, earlier this year. And he said what you said just now, but in a very blunt way, he said, we should stop worrying about what governments think of us. We need to make them worried about us. Now, that sounds absolutely great, but the governments hold the purse strings. Of course. Well, but this is where the leadership comes. Again, I, I would agree with that statement. I think th there comes a point where um, the mission, not the mission statement, the mission itself becomes really what should drive you in doing these things. And yes, the funding comes from the states. The system is state-centric, state-owned, state-sort-of-performed, all of the things that we see around us. But it all depends on how you look at this. Are you going to accompany that and simply sort of passively sort of uh, complain about the fact that it's there but make it happen day in, day out? Or as many workers, a whole new generation, people around the world are saying this entity for all of its fault, and I'm a big critic of it, has nonetheless a certain promise. And that promise can only happen if the states are essentially held accountable for the things that they are impeding the, the story is that we look at the Rwanda genocide. I mean, it's a story of sort of essentially administrative failure. Everyone has the details. They were there, the possibilities were there. The people in charge there were saying, we can do this. And then the bureaucracy of it, the, the will, the division, the outlook on Africa, all of this spelled 
essentially paralysis, and it spelled one million uh, killed, of course, at the hands of the strife between the population. But nonetheless, you had a context in which if different leadership had sort of been visible and played out, it could have had a different outcome. But this is, I mean, the one thing where we might all agree that the UN has, has, has often failed spectacularly, and that is in preventing or resolving conflict in Rwanda, in former Yugoslavia, the Srebrenica, for example, a terrible example, and of course in Syria now, where you have ridiculous paralysis at the UN Security Council. Danny, I'm, I'm no, I, I we don't really know how many conflicts the UN has prevented, uh, in a sense. And I do point out a statistic from the Bronx, I become very utilitarian. Uh, the budget of the entire UN system is 36 hours of the defense budget of the United States. So when we're looking at the capacity of the UN, Mahmoud says that there haven't been certain results, which is true, but on the other hand, have they been given the means to do what they're supposed to do? Coming back to political will, but now in a financial se setting. When you look at the Congo, Democratic Republic of the Congo, since 1999, they've had a stabilization force there of over a billion dollars a year and 15,000 troops. Now, if you ask, is it working? The only question is, what would happen if they all left? Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the means to do what you're supposed to do and your hopes and aspirations, it's very difficult to say you failed. And the answer for the UN is, well, allow us to work and give us the means. And I come back to the WHO. If you look at the budget of the WHO, it's about $4 billion a year. The Gates Foundation has $56 billion. So there is the private sector now is more and more involved simply because the budget of the organization is suffering from the fact that states are not paying or they should be paying more. Just staying with the, the peace resolution, conflict resolution, peacekeeping, Malika, do you have confidence in the UN to, to try to resolve conflict? Say, for example, if Kashmir was to kick off, would you be saying, we need the UN there, the UN can sort this out? Um, I would honestly believe that we need we would, in the case of Kashmir at least, we, I think all the parties involved would prefer a more regional sort of an organization that can understand the local dynamics better because as, at least I think um, the general perception of the UN is that it's a little detached from the reality. So I would ideally prefer, uh, maybe if the UN could just oversee it, but I think for the actual negotiation, people would prefer a more regional organization. What do you think when you hear that, Mahmoud? The UN is detached. I mean, I thought they were supposed to be locally focused, that this was one of the things that they've been you know, trying to, to promote in the last few years. Right, right. Well, I, I think Malika is, 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 is not wrong in what, what she describes. I don't see them as mutually exclusive, these two approaches. There's, there's a whole sort of school of thought and, and practice and reports and evidence that a regional say peace operation for instance uh, stands more chances for success familiarity trust uh, engagement with the local actors mediation becomes very it's about sort of the contextualization of the issues and, and that's quite straightforwardly understood. Uh, that comes also with the risk of having too much sort of closeness to the issues and not enough detachment, bringing back through the window the question of the politics of it and, and the special envoys and who does what and the usual sort of game and game of suspicions too. Uh, that's why I think sort of a, um, a, a global perspective for the so-called international community, which is a problematic term because it really tends to refer to essentially the P5 plus, shall we say, but the international community in, in, a, in, a, in a philosophical sense in the sense of all of us watching at a distance uh, a conflict uh, has to remain in the picture because it brings the context in terms of what needs to be done when you're facing, say, um, a, a genocide in Myanmar where we're not seeing much action or essentially um, 
the situation of Muslims in China uh, or racial injustice in the United States. And those voices need to be brought all the time into that, that discussion, as it were. But I, I think the, the point we, we were, that Danny was making earlier uh, about the private world being increasingly involved is, is important warrants attention because it cuts both ways. It's, it's actually problematic to see that private actors driven uh, by profit, which is their prerogative, are increasingly coming sort of to be engaged in that. If they do this through foundations, through choice, values, it's perfectly acceptable, but it kind of raises the question of back to the state, its displacement, willingly, unwillingly, how it stands in this. And that's why we need to have this larger conversation, I think, certainly, I think, with civil society, but also to have the private, the corporate world somehow uh, be held accountable, not simply by because it wants to be involved or has these voluntary codes or whatnot, but because we need to delimit a place for it that would be legitimate um, and, and, and with a certain sense of accountability, as it were, as well. That reminds me of a very interesting uh, debate that I went to, it's probably 10 years ago now, but at the World Economic Forum in Davos, specifically about these big corporations and their charitable efforts. So we have, as you said, the Gates Foundation, billions and billions and billions of dollars. And, you know, there would perhaps be people in the world who say, do you have to spend it all on malaria and TB? You know, there are other causes. And we get into this, this question of that there are business leaders determining the worth, the needs, yeah. the global needs. Um, and progressing from that, um, I was reading four scenarios for the UN over the next few decades. And one of them was that the nation states collapse and that transnational corporate become the big powers. Where, where, if, the, if that were to happen, let's start with you, Danny, where, where would the, how would that work? If our world is ruled by money and consumerism and the decisions well, I mean, of big business. Th that's almost inevitable. But one of the things the UN has, perhaps its greatest comparative advantage, is a sense of legitimacy. Yes. In other words, corporations, individuals can do certain things, but the UN still has a stamp that says this is an official document, this is an official special rapporteur, this is an official organization, and that still has legitimacy around the world. Now, we have all these workarounds, these different kinds of associations, can be corporations, can be the World Economic Forum, but still the UN has an authority and a legitimacy now, what is that based on? Partially, it's based on a moral sense. Partially, it's based on a legal sense. Uh, there are different kinds of legitimacy. Greta has legitimacy to address the uh, General Assembly. Uh, perhaps Bill Gates has legitimacy because he has money. But the UN has a special legal legitimacy that's recognized around the world. And that's something that can't be discriminated against. And there's no competition for that. When the UN says this is a resolution, this is a decision, the International Court of Justice makes a decision that's different from someone else, and that's something that you don't lose. Although the moral thing can be lost. If I may jump in on, on that. And because that legitimacy is, uh, by all available evidence, still desired by a large sort of chunk of the world's population, this is the sort of place that it occupies. By virtue of that legitimacy, then what I think the United Nations has to move towards now is proactively itself sort of embracing the fact that the world is changing by this multiplicity of new actors who are what they are, essentially, and, and either by choice or by engagement or by sheer presence. We have not mentioned the role of non-state actors, for instance, in armed conflicts, who humanitarians find unavoidable. Uh, it raises matters of engagement, of mediation, of negotiation, all of these. And that's just a relatively classical case, right? But if you look at sort of the, the sum total of these kind of uh, um, uh, murmur of, of new actors emerging gradually, I think the United Nations, by virtue precisely of the, the, this legitimacy, which I agree is absolutely still there, has itself, instead of being sort of passively protective of its kind of domain, see, seeing the world is moving forward, 
the civil society discussion, which has long been there, and initially, to be, uh, to be honest, was looked upon suspiciously by the UN, kept at bay. I think it has to be embraced. It has to be brought in the fold, because there's so much good work being done that could improve the quality of the reflection of the thinking, and I think that legitimacy can then be maintained with far more of a sort of successful vision moving forward uh, in that sense. But again, back to the leadership that needs to make that happen. It has to be more inclusive. Uh, Richard Falk has for years said there should be a people's assembly, not just an assembly of the state representatives. Yes, I mean, it's, it sounds great. You could also see chaos ensuing from something like that. But I want to bring you in, Malika, though, because we've heard Danny and Mahmoud talk about the legitimacy of the United Nations. Um, I mean, legitimacy, legitimacy is something that's conferred. People believe a body is legitimate. Do you, and your friends, do you see the UN with that stamp of legitimacy still? If the UN says achieving this particular standard is important, do you think, yep, it is? Okay, before I answer that question, I'd just like to add the point that I think with, um, when we're talking about civil society organizations, then if we uh, look at them in terms of funding, then I think an important aspect is that if we, um, if the UN emphasizes funding from these alternate sources apart from its member states, there is a certain reduction in the dependency of the UN on funding uh, through its important member states like the US, which could also, I mean, it could protect the structural integrity of the UN from the whims of changing regimes, which I think might be a useful um, feature. Apart from that, when we're talking about legitimacy of the UN, I definitely the UN, for all its shortcomings, does have a certain stamp of legitimacy. And if there is one body that people look to solve international problems, that would be the UN. It's interesting, isn't it, that um, despite the uh, dismissive tone of some countries about the United Nations, they all will do their utmost to avoid getting discussed by the UN Human Rights Council, for example. You know, although people will say that the Human Rights Council has no power, has no teeth, and you know, the Security Council won't pay attention to it, just the mere fact of people getting together and talking about a situation strikes fear into the bones of governments, doesn't it? As it should, if it is this world's assembly, as it stands, and if it could be even improved further, as we were discussing, quite logically, you would want the stigma attached with some sort of, um, sort of criticism, which oftentimes is produced with a report behind it, with evidence. I mean, this mm -hmm. is not done lightly, uh, as it were. That stigma, would, you would want to avoid that uh, as a state, as, as, a, as a nation, as a society, in terms of, of that. I think, for me, it raises this other aspect, which we mentioned in passing, which is the ethical dimension to this. There's a lot of values that presided over the sort of the history of the United Nations. Let's go back to this moment, which is really kind of a moment of a huge promise. Um, you're looking at the 1940s. The world has large chunks of it still under colonialism. Mm -hmm. You are exiting from a world war. You have a certain sort of, it's, it's very interesting to see that this vision materialized around there. It was still the vision of a few. It did not include as many as it, it, it should or would eventually. But sort of the promise of that, is, I, I think, is, is the glue we have to go back to all the time. And this stigma associated with those uh, qualifications is absolutely central. Now, of course, it comes with a responsibility. So if you're going to put a human rights council looking at human rights in that sense, you do have to be consistent. You do have to make sure your, your mechanisms are credible. You need to make sure that those elected to essentially assess others are people that have perfect credentials or acceptable credentials at, at the very least, on and on. And I think that there's a certain mechanisms there. Um, I, I want to mention the work of UNDP, for instance, which is for often forgotten in this conversation, which I think in terms of the research uh, did a superb job throughout the 2000s, for instance, with the Arab Human Rights, uh, Human Development Reports, a series of very sharp reports that pointed out precisely to the role of civil society, uh, all manners of human security, as uh, matters of education, gender, they made it to a pre-Arab sort of Spring conversation, and they were produced by a lot of uh, authors and researchers from the region itself. So you can have such dynamics which produce sort of a, a increased uh, legitimacy and, and ownership, to, her, to, to Malika's point, about the regional context, which is fundamental.
and, and let's not forget, I mean, we, we, we've talked about all the problems, but I mean, just a few days ago, uh, the UN got the different military factions in Libya to sign a permanent ceasefire. You know, it's, it's rather, people don't pay that much attention to Libya, sadly, these days. Um, but that is a huge development for, for civilians in Libya if it sticks. Or the, I think, 23 reports from the Commission of Inquiry on Syria. This, we think, will ensure that there is no impunity for what happened there. Well, I mean, of course. I mean, it's, it's that kind of um, protection belt you need to have all the time. I don't think in Syria and Libya the United Nations has done a very good job, uh, frankly. If you go back to Libya itself a few months back, in the spring, the previous special envoy, Hassan Salama, uh, resigned with a resounding criticism of the Security Council, saying that it had politicized the issues. And those are strong words coming from someone who had been involved a lot uh, in the issue. Syria itself has, has moved from something where we had several possibilities of making something happen. Let's go back to the Kofi Annan missions. Let's go back to Geneva 1 and 2, everything that was on the table. It shifted to the terrain of essentially real politic in a neo-Cold War with Russia and the United States, not to mention the regional powers, uh, Saudi Arabia and others involved in all manners of, of calculation. And the jihadists of this world, of course, flocking there, as it were. I think we sort of, uh, there was a wrong turn taken on the Syria issue very rapidly, 2013, 2014. Mm -hmm. Well, that's certainly true, but here you put the your finger on the tensions between Geneva and New York. Yes. Because we have the humanitarian exactly. community and the human rights experts here tearing their hair out in frustration about what's going on there and paralysis exactly. in New York towards a political solution. We are going to turn this uh, debate over to uh, questions now before we... we uh, we talk, we talk our, our audience out of any time. Um, Dale, I know you have uh, had some questions online, so fire away. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, from people who are watching uh, online, following the live stream, one question is also a, a suggestion. How about adding a parliamentary assembly to the UN General Assembly in order to truly represent the peoples of the world? And as an example, um, this viewer suggests a good model would be the um, EU Parliament. And I've got a couple <laughs> other questions, but maybe you can tackle that one first. Oh, who wants to answer that first? Well, I mean, this is what I mentioned as far as Richard Falk has, has ha had this out there for years. Uh, the difficulty on a global scale would be determining how many from each region, how the elections would be held. And what we've seen in the United Nations is that the members of the Security Council have held on to their power. Uh, and any dilution of that power, be it the veto or anything else, uh, they don't accept that. Uh, and that's something that is very difficult to understand why change is so difficult. If you look at the history of the UN, the League of Nations was founded after the First World War. The United Nations was founded after the Second World War. At the end of the Cold War, the only two major changes were the agreement on tariffs and trade. GATT became the World Trade Organization, and the Human Rights Commission became the Human Rights Council. That's not very impressive. So we don't have a movement now. Even the pandemic or the 2008 financial crisis has not allowed a certain dust to be cleared in the UN system, and it's difficult to see how in the future something like a People's Assembly can take, uh, can take place. Mahmoud, you wanted to? Yeah, very quickly. I, th I think it's an important question. We can link this actually to our title, I in effect. For sure, if the UN does not adapt, it it's, it's not going to disappear. We can answer this very straightforwardly. It will be around in the next five years. But in the medium to long term, any institution that really does not address transformation and change and is proactive, as we were saying, is not helping itself be, remain relevant and so on. Now, one of the ways, and we, I think, all mentioned it here, is to be in sync with the debate and the views and the engagement at another level, which is not the state-on-state state level, but the societal level. And it's, yes, there are other ways to do that. 
EU bureaucracy is certainly no, <laughs> I think, model to follow as far as I'm concerned, but I think we've seen the logic of a, what an IPU is doing on the side, which is not always in sync with the UN, uh, the Interparliamentary Union, with its engagement in different places. So there's, there's a space there for upgrading the voices of societies, not through sort of the transmission belt of the states uh, and, and how this becomes uh, uh, translated in, in different terms. So I, I'd certainly see this as, as, as something to explore for the UN itself, but I'd say using existing other fora that are out there. More questions, are there any from the floor also? I mean, you sir. There's a microphone coming. Uh, since we're talking about this issue of um, legitimacy and, I guess, the democratic um, deficit that's inherent to the UN structure, um, I personally don't see, I personally see the, the UN carrying this moral and legal authority that you were speaking about. Um, but things like the, the P5 and the Security Council and the sort of Western-centric focus of UN operations in general sort of uh, bring the, the idea that, that, that there's not much of a future of multilateralism in the UN without um, some sort of reform or adaptation as you guys are talking about. Um, what are ways in which other powerful states that might not be in the P5 and civil society can challenge these, these imbalances uh, in the UN? Malika, what do you think about that? I mean, from India, India would probably like to have a bigger role in mm -hmm. the United Nations. And, you know, even the evolution and the development since 1945 should have, but doesn't. What, how do you think India could reassert it? I mean, it's like earlier how we talked about um, in 19, the P5 structure of today is reflective of the 1945 structure and not today's world relations. At the same time, I mean, if states like India were, what, were to reassert their power, it's not going to be easy because, as uh, you said, the P5 doesn't want to dilute its powers at all. So within the UN structure itself, it's I don't see how they could strive to um, increase their power. Maybe through the creation of regional initiatives, it might pose a challenge to the existing structure. but. Um, I don't see how it's going to work out within the structure of the UN itself. Danny, did you want to say, I mean, we keep coming, butting our heads up against the Security Council and the P5, don't we? Well, uh, there, a group has been working on that for years, mm -hmm. including the Swiss. There are some suggestions. Uh, instead of just lodging it, for example, limit or take away the veto power. For example, if it's an issue that's dealing with one of the P5, they don't have the right to veto that. Uh, so there are different scenarios to try to get around that problem, uh, especially now, because we see that even after the Cold War, there was this period of euphoria, but now we see with China and the United States, the Security Council is basically blocked. Uh, and that could mean also that any chance of changing it or arranging certain things around the veto uh, are very, very difficult. Uh, and that, I think, is really something that we haven't seen before. After the Cold War, there was a period where there was hope that the Security Council on certain issues could say, okay, we all agree that this is something we have to do together, but that seems to be gone now. Mahmoud, I mean, how are we gonna wrestle these vetoes away from yeah. the P5? And it's not really easy to do this when you've reached the point of reform of the reform of the Security Council, which, which is roughly where we are today. I, I think the, the, the question that um, the gentleman raises is, there's two levels that, that I see quickly. There's the Security Council issue. And I, and I share Daniel's uh, sort of assessment. It's not going to happen overnight. It may not even happen. But if it doesn't happen, we're, uh, there's really a problem there. Given the prerogative of the Security Council and deciding on all matters having to do with international security. And this has real consequences, including with the involvement of regional 
organizations that would follow on missions and so on. So this is a big chunk of this, and we need to get there one way or another, whether this is through sort of the voting, voting procedure, whether this is through some sort of expansion, and so on. And diversity is fundamental to that. But there's a deeper point to what he's mentioning, which is the very question of representativity in the system itself. And it's no surprise that you have the type of problematic humanitarian organizations, uh, missions rather than you talk about, when you have no diversity issue within the entity itself, which represents the world. As I mentioned earlier, the, the, the facts about sort of a few uh, top countries uh, uh, concentrating all of the top jobs, uh, or a figure like 90% of some of the positions uh, in, say, the uh, policy, strategic policy uh, office in New York are held by Westerners. Or the fact that OCHA uh, has been led in the past couple of years by four individuals from the same country, uh, the UK for that matter, including three white men. So, and this is OCHA, whose very mission is to engage with humanitarian missions around the world, so on. So there's, and that's not just about who has the position, it's about the sink, the relevance, the position, and the credibility of these missions. So if you don't address that, how is it going to go down to the missions that are populated by the world, uh, as it were? So there's two, the, these two aspects. There's a political level, which remains stuck, uh, and there's, I think, the organizational structure, which needs to do far better than what it's doing on those aspects. C can I add just a little footnote? I, Namu, yes, we I understand and we agree, except that certain countries pay more than others. Yes. If you pay more, yes. then you have more power. Unfortunately. We agree. Yes, but I mean, it, it's surely, I mean, the World Food Program doesn't always have to be in the hands of a, of a U.S. citizen. That is what's, I mean, uh, that annoys, I know they pay a lot, but, but, you know, they should be generous just to pay and... Let the others pay more. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Dale, you have another question from online? There are many questions, I think. <laughs> the last Good. few minutes of your this very fascinating conversation has, has really uh, encouraged a lot of viewers to ask. What I'll do is I'll read out a few of them. You may okay. see some connections, but I'll let you decide which ones you want to comment or answer. Um, shouldn't the UN empower regional groups, such as the African or European Union, in order to, to promote regional multilateralism, something that you touched on earlier? Um, how does the pandemic highlight the UN's influence in the world, but also flaws in its governance? Um, can we not use a similar mechanism, um, such as the one we saw in 2000 at the Millennial Summit, when 1,400 NGOs represented mm -hmm. civil society. Um, a lot of comments, as you've uh, really touched on, about the, the flaws because of the, the five powers controlling the Security Council. And what about a weighted vote at the General Assembly, together with making its resolutions binding in exchange of removing the veto power? Um, I think a, a really good um, final question, which role do you see for young UN staff in transforming the UN to make it more participatory? A sounding board or having a seat at the decision table? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Malika, do you want, maybe you want to answer the, the last one. Do you see, would you like to see a stronger role for the younger generation in the UN? You know, UN staff, but from a younger generation bringing in that perspective? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think the need for you, um, youth representation in the UN, whether at, at all levels, is f completely fundamental, particularly decision making. But at all levels, I feel like the youth is just one of the most underrepresented uh, sections of society, which really needs to change. Danny? There's I mean, a whole slew of questions. One set an answer to three of the things, if you allow me there. The use of regional organizations, you mentioned the EU and the African Union. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would assume that you don't mean NATO uh, on certain things. Uh, and I think there is an interesting decentralization. Security Council, the interesting question of democracy is the re relationship between the Security Council and the General Assembly. And we see that the General Assembly has lost its fundamental role uh, as an equal partner. Uh, and that's something that has to be thought about. The NGOs, the 1,400, how many, the great problem always with NGOs is who's going to get accredited. 
at the Human Rights Council. If it's Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, you can come in. If it's different NGOs, which perhaps are associated with the government or something else, the question is, who has the legitimacy to come into the meeting? Uh, and that's a big problem for all meetings involving NGOs. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would add fundamentally, I mean, these are all very important points and dimensions, but I, I really think at this stage, given particularly the COVID uh, question, we really need kind of a quantum leap in thinking. The UN has to be much more sort of ambitious about the thinking about these questions. If you think about it organizationally, any other organization, particularly we spoke about the corporate world, we can speak about universities or any other place. There's a lot of investment in thinking in sort of what, what the new world is sort of forcing on us in terms of paradigm shifts, as, as they're called. The UN, in many cases, is, tends to go back to sort of previous configurations and therefore takes that as a matrix. As, as if it's almost inevitable, including what we've been discussing about the Security Council, uh, for instance, as opposed to imagining other aspects. The international, the regional organizations have, are already, in fact, in many ways empowered, not that the UN has to empower them, but they are. And in many ways, they're like mini UNs. Uh, if you look at the AU, the EU, they're not necessarily that different in terms of culture, in terms of all the problems that we've mentioned, in terms of privileging sort of the security angle as opposed to the softer issues we've mentioned. Uh, more involvement of sort of wider, uh, the wider realm of voices, I'm all for that. I think the place of civil society by essence, by legitimacy, I think is to provide that. And I think it could do far better, uh, the UN that is, in sort of embracing the, those voices as it were. Um, and I think on the COVID itself, uh, as we started the conversation with, uh, you want to be fair to the UN, this is completely new, this is a configuration, but then again, you've ha they've had these offices that you mentioned for many years sort of uh, working on uh, preparedness. Uh, and so now is the time to make that happen. And, and, and the danger in not making that happen is to have these countries go back to a lot of provincialism. You're seeing these states, these, in, these regional organizations, these states, these countries, these local kind of actors dealing with the problem almost in isolation when clearly travel, interdependence, transnational, as you mentioned, th these are the terms that preside over this particular crisis. Thank you. Do we have time for one more question? I think there was one person in the audience, if it's a short one, because I know we're, we are on our hour deadline. But Well, um, it is clear that discussing the future of the UN is to discuss the future of multilateralism itself. Uh, in 2012, the then Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, said that uh, we are living a crisis of solidarity. And just a few days ago, the then current Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, said that solidarity is self-interest. So it is especially true in a context of the, the biggest climate crisis that humanity ever faced. So my question is, will the future of the UN be defined by how it deals with the climate emergency as a problem without passport, as Kofi Annan would say? Thank you very much. Will the future of the UN be defined by how it tackles the climate emergency? I, I, my gut feeling would be to say yes to that, but I will defer to our experts. Danny, what do you think? I think it was Ronald Reagan who said that if the Earth was invaded by Martians, we would all cooperate. Uh, and I don't think the pandemic or global unemployment has got, or climate change has gotten to the point of fundamental change in our mentality needing cooperation. I come back to end of First World War, League of Nations, end of Second World War, the United Nations. Is that what it takes to get countries to cooperate History tells us maybe that's true. Malika? I mean, I think the way the UN sort of tackles the crisis of climate change not only defines the UN's future, but basically everyone's future. Because as of now, we this is one problem that's, fa that's being faced by literally every human on this planet. So, I mean, the UN, this is not just a test of legitimacy for the UN, but it's also a roadmap for the future. Mahmoud, I don't know if you saw the reports today, this exclusive that this Siberian ice cap is melting, the thing that the environmentalists call the sleeping giant, which would release lots of methane, and, I mean, potentially quite frightening. And, and, and we're bound to see more of those, and they call exactly for, as my colleagues were saying, for cooperation. 
Um, but, but I think the, the question raises, a, I disagree with Mr. Guterres. I don't think that um, cooperation is self-interest. I think cooperation is altruism. There's a certain generosity that, that you have to sort of move towards. If it's only for my survival in this world, which can generate a certain technique of cooperation, uh, it's, it's negatively defined. I see this as more something that needs to be positively de defined. I need to want to go and help and do these things and, and, and help. There's an ethical dimension that has been missing in this conversation. And today, more than ever, with the environmental issue, with the health issue, with the racism question, it, it really is calling for a, a far more sort of a demanding uh, moral stance on our part. And I think this is exactly what will recapture sort of the original idea of an entity that wanted to move away from all of these wars and all of these uh, colonial s histories, as it were, to move towards a new page. Uh, and today may be the possibility to sort of, or the opportunity we started with to, to do that. Dale, you had, no. Well, I think then, because we're actually overrunning, um, that brings us to the end of this very special live podcast. Let me sum up a little bit what I, what I took from our discussion. Um, that the United Nations needs to be more ambitious. It needs to be more inclusive. It needs to be braver, perhaps have more of a, a moral stance. Dale, I have one question for you. Was there anybody coming in online who kind of questioned the existence of the United Nations altogether? I think in the way that you all have, um, questioning the legitimacy because of the, as you mentioned, the five Ps who control the Security Council and ultimately the, the, the big decisions that have to be taken. Um, and uh, I think some, someone did ask near the end, do you foresee the possible dissolution of the UN? I think your answer was, uh, at the moment, no, um, but yes, what? Uh, no one has a crystal ball. I think that comes across clearly. And But yes, general um, dissatisfaction with this lack of real representation globally. That's my point as we, as we come to the end of this debate, though we've had 75 years of the United Nations, and despite the criticisms, and there are many from all different quarters and for all different reasons, it doesn't seem as if anybody is saying, let's just get rid of it, let's abolish it. Or, as a, it's a cliche, but we've heard it many times, even cynical US diplomats do say, if we didn't have the United Nations, we'd have to invent it. Perhaps the job is to reinvent it in a different form. Security Council reform seems absolutely unavoidable. And as we said, more ambitious, more inclusive. Um, and less timid. My thanks to uh, Mahmoud Mohamedou, Malika Girl, and Daniel Warner, to our audience here in the uh, auditorium who have braved a semi-locked down Geneva, and to our audience online. Thanks very much, and as I said, tune in every couple of weeks or subscribe on Apple Podcasts to Inside Geneva. We hope you enjoyed this program. Thank you all. Thank you for the questions. Thank you can, can I say Thank something? You. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I wasn't here when the Graduate Institute was founded in 1927, uh, but in its original charter, which I have read, it was to have two things to do. One was to have an input into the League of Nations, and the second was to have an input into peace and security. I was here. 25 years ago, when we organized the largest celebration for the 50th anniversary of the UN outside of New York. We had Boutrous Boutrous Galley, we had the Seven Conseil d'Etat of Geneva, uh, and I do think it's a wonderful experience to be here in the Graduate Institute, but because of the pandemic, it's not quite the celebration <laughs> we had 25 years ago. Yeah. However, I will finish by saying I look forward in 25 years to being its 100th celebration. Thank you. Okay. I can only agree with that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you.